Thank you for welcoming a Canadian who truly loves Americans. Beginning with the apostles, our Lord Jesus Christ has assembled many great men over the centuries. In the early church, you have your Irenaeus, you have your Augustine, and in the Reformation, you have your luminaries, often described as the never-to-be-sufficiently-praised reformers, such as Calvin, Luther, Melanchthon, and you have, of course, in the 19th century, Spurgeon. You have your Whitfields and a host of other men that have blessed the church. But in the 17th century, in fact, even going back to the 1570s, you have the men called the Puritans. The Puritans who are beloved by so many and in many circles still shaping how we think about Jesus Christ, how we think about the triune God, and how we think about pastoral theology. There are many words, of course, that could be used to describe the Puritans, and they are exceedingly precious, they are godly, they are learned, but above all, they were concerned for the church of Jesus Christ. And if you want to understand anything about the Puritans, you must understand this, that the movement began as an attempt to reform the Church of England. The church is always, always in need of reformation, and reformation was what they sought to accomplish. And it took about 70 years until the 1640s when they were able to accomplish a great deal of reformation in what was about a 20-year period from 1640 to 1660. In that period, they compiled the Westminster Confession of Faith, and that confession has impacted churches in Britain, in America, in Canada, and indeed all over the world. And those confessions that were written were written by men who sought to put above all things Jesus Christ in his rightful place as the King and Lord of the church. Now, the Puritans were, of course, men that uh, went through many persecutions. They fought for what they believed was the truth. And many of them, such as Thomas Goodwin, gave up advancing very quickly in the Church of England because he would not conform to some of the ungodly and unbiblical practices that were being imposed upon him. And so instead of compromising, he was exiled to Arnhem in Holland, where he believed that he could worship according to his conscience and according to the truth. That was what made men like Goodwin and other Puritans the men that they were. Now, if there are a number of things that I could describe about the Puritans, the first thing I would describe is that they were truly great theologians. One only has to think of somebody like John Owen. And as I was thinking about what would it be that I could single out from John Owen's 24 volumes that I would suggest you read, it became exceedingly difficult for the simple fact that he seemed to excel his peers in almost every area, whether it was the Trinity and communion with the triune God, whether it was looking at sin, and not just a few pages on the fact that we are sinners, but hundreds of pages on how defiled, how wicked, how gross, how evil, how pernicious sin really is. He was a heart surgeon par excellence when it came to the doctrine of sin. When it came to the doctrine of Christology, it is my firm belief that no man in the history of the Christian church has made such contributions to how we understand the person and work of Christ as John Owen. There are certain things that he says that will simply boggle your mind. But very closely behind John Owen was a man called Thomas Goodwin who wrote a book called The Heart of Christ in Heaven Towards Sinners on Earth. 
And there he speaks not about Christ's divine nature so much, but about his true human heart, his true human compassions. And he makes a number of beautiful comments, one of which, if there were millions of worlds of loving creatures, they would not have the love in their hearts as in the heart of the man Christ Jesus. The man who now ascended in heaven as your high priest is moved more to pity your sins than to be angry with your sins. The man who now is in heaven and he loves you so much and is interested so much in your sanctification and in your well-being because he is a good husband and he who loves his wife loves himself. And so the more love he shows to his bride, the more care he shows to his people, the more love he shows to himself. And for that reason, you can be sure that Christ is more interested in your sanctification than even you are. This is some of the theology that men like Thomas Goodwin gave us. He also helps us to understand the perspective of why God created the world. And one of my favorite comments from him goes along this line. God did not send Christ into the world for us, but he sent us into the world for Jesus Christ. These are the types of things you will read in our Puritan theology. But you'll also read of other men, and I could go on for many hours, and I'm conscious that my time is quickly running out, but a man like Stephen Charnock, who writes what I think is the most impressive work on the doctrine of God, the doctrine of his attributes. And he goes through all of God's attributes and hundreds and hundreds of pages bleeding out, who is God? And if there is only one quote I can give for you from his work, I'm sure you will appreciate it. He speaks about God's goodness. And he speaks about how there was a greater goodness. A greater goodness was shown by the Father to us than was for even a time shown to his Son as he hung upon the cross. A greater goodness to sinners like us than to his own Son. And so when you read the Puritans and you read of their robust Christology, their penetrating Trinitarian theology, you can come to no other conclusion than what they wrote was meant to be preached, and what they preached was meant to be lived, because all of their doctrine was for life. And if they could not preach it, it was not good theology. Now, as we consider their context, I think you will understand that the reason these men were such penetrating theologians, the reason these men could write hundreds of pages of profound thoughts is because these men lived in the context of the battle. And where the battle rages there, the loyalty of the soldier is tested. Civil war, plagues, fires, many of them having to deal with their children dying at birth, not just once, not just twice, but even in the case of one theologian, nine times. They suffered, and they suffered deeply, but their suffering was our gain. Their suffering enabled them to pen things that we could never dream of in the comfort and luxuries of our modern age. They were ministers. And I hope that you will know that the greatest gifts to the church that God has given have always been ministers. God had one son, and he made him a minister. Now, in conclusion, I wanted to just give you a few thoughts to take with you as you think about the Puritans and think about this book that I have been privileged to co-author with Joel. 
And the first is, as you read this book, you might have some misconceptions erased from your mind about the Puritans. Some people have thought of them as legalistic. Some people have thought of them as compromising the doctrine of assurance. And I trust this book will put those silly notions to rest. Some have even accused the Puritans of being slave owners. And I can say to you with a great deal of certainty and willing to put my scholarly reputation on the line that we do not have a single record of one English Puritan ever owning a slave. We have to read the Puritans, understand the Puritans on their terms rather than entertain certain misconceptions. But as you read about the Puritans, and you read about the Puritans in the book that we have collaborated, you'll come to understand how profound and beautiful theology really is. You'll come to understand things that you never thought of. I remember reading some of the treaties by various Puritan theologians and thinking, how did they ever come up with this? And then after thinking that, realizing how simple and how profound what they were saying was. And if there was one simple and yet profound truth that I learned from the Puritans, it is this. Why? Why do you think heaven is eternal? Why will we be in heaven forever? Have you ever thought about that? Why is it that we should live forever and ever and ever, millions upon millions, billions upon billions of years without any end. Why is that? Is it simply because God has said so? Of course God could say that, and that would be good enough for us. His bare word is good enough for us, but there's a more theological reason. What is that theological reason? Well, we are married to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his bride. And two things would have to happen for heaven to end. God would have to obliterate the person of his son from existence, which is an ontological impossibility, or God would have to do this. He would have to sin himself. Why is that? Because our God has said, I hate divorce. And so the reason, the reason you will live forever and ever in heaven is because God hates divorce and God loves his son. And for those reasons, you can be sure that your heavenly existence will never fade, perish, or spoil. You will be there forever and ever. And it's reading the theologians that I've spoken about it's getting into their works that you begin to think Christologically about these things. It's reading these works that you begin to think like Christians, as Trinitarians. And it's reading about their works that God becomes exceedingly big. And as a result, we become exceedingly small. And when we are small and when God is big, we are in the safest place. These are the theologians that I commend to you, the Puritans. Well, now you know why I chose Mark Jones as my uh, co-author for this book. Um, I grew up in a family where we were nurtured and nursed on the Puritans from, from infancy, actually. My dad read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress to us every single Sunday evening. And as children, even as four or five-year-olds, we'd ask him, what does Mr. Talkative mean? What does the house of the interpreter mean? How does the Holy Spirit work in the soul? My dad would lay down the book and he'd talk to us about, experientially, about the Spirit's work in the soul. And so, for me, I've breathed and lived Puritan theology since, since a child. When I was nine years old, I 
came under great conviction of sin. And uh, I was convinced I was a very bad boy. And so I went to my dad's bookcase and I, I looked over all the books and I saw a book called The Life and Death of Mr. Badman. I said, well, I'm a bad boy and a bad man. They, they must fit together. So I pulled down the book and I read through John Bunyan's Life and Death of Mr. Badman. Uh, when I was 14, the conviction became much more severe and I ended up reading my dad's entire bookcase of Puritan books, the old Banner Truth paperbacks printed in the 60s and, and 70s. And I found those books to be balm for my soul. And they led me to gospel liberty and filled me with a passion that has never left me all my life to propagate these, this profound, biblical, reformed, practical, doctrinal, experiential theology in all its richness and glory that the Puritans so exemplify for us. Particularly when I was 17, I read through Thomas Goodwin's Christ Our Mediator, and it was the most profound experience I ever had of the Lord Jesus Christ. This book set my soul at liberty, and it gave me a passion to start a book ministry, uh, and then another, 20 years later, called Reformation Heritage Books, in which my goal is simply to spread this wonderful theology around the world. Now, already as a teenager, I had this desire to write a Puritan systematic theology because no one had ever done it and because it needed to be done. Because even then, 40 years ago, some people were struggling reading the old language. And I thought, if someone could just put Puritan theology in one book and make it contemporary so people read it and it becomes a gateway to their reading the Puritans, that would be great. And I always expected someone to do it. But no one did. And then three or four years ago, I think it was now, uh, Mark Jones sent me some chapters for a book on Puritan covenant theology. And I said, Mark, these are exactly the areas where I have not studied the Puritans in depth. And here's areas I've studied. Could we collaborate? Instead of us publishing your book, could we do a book together and do a full Puritan systematic theology? He said, great idea. Write out an outline. So I wrote out an outline of 80 chapters. He wrote back and said, that's going to be three volumes. So we cut back to 40 chapters. After we got the 40 written, we then added one chapter at a time. and said, we can't, we can't not do a chapter on providence. When Flavel wrote The Mystery of Providence, it got added back in. And we ended up with a book of 60 chapters, 50 of which take you through the doctrines of grace, the doctrine of God and man and Christ, salvation, church, and the last things. And then the last group of chapters shows you how the Puritans take those doctrines and put them into practice in daily meditation, in life, in the home, in the family, family worship, in your own conscience, and in personal prayer. And so what we've tried to do in this book is give you, under one cover, what you need to understand the contributions of the Puritans that they have made, taking, mind you, 16th century Reformation doctrine, they were thoroughly reformed, but now taking it and applying it to life. That's the power of the Puritans. Now, I think the Reformers would have gotten around to this as well, but they were too busy hammering out doctrines vis-a-vis -vis Rome to do much about practical daily living. And so the Puritans wrestled with questions like, how can we know for sure we're saved? And if we're saved, how should we live as individuals? How should we lead our families, our churches, our nation? And they forged answers to these questions in the furnace of suffering. And as a result, their theology radiates warmth and depth and light and passion. So doctrinally, Puritans embraced a broad and vigorous and confessional reformed orthodoxy. Experientially, that is the experience of the soul, they were warm and devoted to communion with God. Ecclesiastically, they were committing, committed to honoring the scriptures alone as God's rule for the faith and the life of the church. Evangelistically, they were aggressive yet tender in presenting the free offer of the gospel and calling sinners to Christ. And pastorally, 
They fostered practical holiness and spiritual growth. I like to tell pastors this. Do you want to see your church more holy? And I like to tell fathers this. Do you want to see your family more holy? There's nothing better you can do than get them on a steady diet of reading the Puritans. There's something about their spiritual depth, their spiritual denigration of man, as Mark just pointed out. We must decrease, Christ must increase, that is power that produces holiness. And when the Spirit blesses those writings to our souls, they are a great boon to us spiritually. So let me just give you a few highlights of what the Puritans do for us before we close this session. Number one, they teach us that all true theology is God-centered, God-adoring, God-fearing, and God-delighting. And their writings permeate and we try to convey that in this book with a sense of the glory, the awesome glory of God. God's a towering mountain, and we are small at his feet. Last Sunday, I'm preaching through Revelation. I preached about the great mighty angel of Revelation 10 who has one foot on the sea and one foot on the land and is in control over all things. Oh, that's the God of the Puritans. He's a mighty God, powerful to help, powerful to redeem powerful to make holy, powerful to save to the end. Secondly, the Puritans also magnify the holiness of God. Edward Lee writes, holiness is the beauty of all God's attributes, the outshining of all that he is, without which his wisdom would be but subtlety, his justice, cruelty, his sovereignty, tyranny, his mercy, foolish pity. And Lee goes on to say, when you understand the holiness of God, you will hunger for holiness in your own life. Third, the Puritans stress the evil of sin. Sin is rebellion against a righteous and loving God. Today, the church rests lightly on sin. The Puritans hated sin with holy hatred because God hates sin with holy hatred. And they called their people to humble themselves before God and repent of their sin. Jeremiah Burroughs' whole book, The Evil of Evils, is based on this thematic statement. There is more evil in the least sin than there is in the greatest affliction. Do you want a heart sensitized to sin so that it can be sensitized to grace and to Christ? Read the Puritans. Fourth, Puritans were moved to humble gratitude. They were so grateful for salvation because they were such big sinners and grace was so amazing. When my dad came out of one of his heart surgeries, I went into his room and he was crying. I asked him why he was crying and he said, well, a nurse just came in and moistened my lips with an ice cube and I was thinking as she did that, the rich man in hell didn't have a drop of water to cool his tongue and I deserve his portion. That is what the Puritans would appreciate. You see, that was a really Puritan-minded statement with a small p. Even the smallest thing, you see, they were full of gratitude for because of what we deserve and because of who God is. Five, the Puritans focus on Christ everywhere. The centrality of the mediator. Entire books written on Jesus and his fullness. One Puritan, Edward Reynolds, writes this, Christ Jesus the Lord is the sum and center of all divine revealed truth. Neither is anything to be preached unto men as an object of their faith, which doth not in some way or other either meet in him or refer to him. There is 10,000 times more beauty and loveliness in him than in all the honors and pleasures and profits and satisfactions which this world can afford. Isaac Ambrosi said, 10 minutes of real communion with Jesus Christ gives a sinner more joy than an entire lifetime lived in this world. And six, the Puritans knew what it was to wrestle in spiritual warfare for holiness. The battles of walking with Christ, the sweating way to heaven, the experiential living in of the doctrines of grace are so rich 
in Puritan theology. So searching, but also they make you relish what they have, and they deepen your spiritual life. Well, these are some of the things that motivated Mark and myself to write this book. It got published four months ago. We decided to take a risk and publish 4,000 copies, hoping they'd last no more than three years. They sold out in six days. We then republished 6,000 more, and they lasted six weeks. We then published 6,000 more, and most of those are gone. And I'm pleased to report that Ligonier is offering the book now, a $60 book, at the lowest price you'll get it anywhere, even lower than us, and we're nonprofit. $27. So help yourself to a book, get some for your friends, and remember when you read it, feel free to just read and pick anywhere, any chapter, anywhere, because every chapter is a standalone chapter. If, you, if you're not into theology, maybe don't read the first few chapters at the beginning. The prolegomena is a little bit difficult at the beginning, not too bad, but go to some of the practical chapters, whet your appetite, then go back to the beginning and read it straight through. And it's our prayer that as you read this book, you will look at some of the footnotes, you will go further, you will start reading the Puritans yourself, and your spiritual life will prosper, and this book will be your gateway to make the Puritans accessible to you. And together, with a book I did a couple years ago with Randall Peterson called Meet the Puritans, which gives you the life and the various books the Puritans writ, wrote, these two books will introduce you to a new world of great reformed spiritual benefit for your soul. May God bless you and bless this book.